blessing to be here today, and it's a wonderful thing when you can come in to the house of God and you can hear godly music being played. It uh, prepares you for worship. Pastors asked me if I'd teach today, and of course I said yes. And I know you'd rather hear the pastor, but I'm what you got. But God's blessed me with this message, and uh, I hope it's a blessing to you. The name of my lesson today is Curses and Allegories. We'll be looking at Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 through 31. Let's pray. Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, Lord, it's all about you, Lord. It's not about me. It's not about anyone in this house. It's about giving you honor and glory and lifting up your word, Lord, and feeding our souls and our spirits that we might follow you and serve you properly and, and right. Lord, let your Holy Spirit come into this place. Let the power of the Holy Spirit come upon me, Lord, and the power of teaching. And let it bring glory and honor and praise to your holy and righteous name. You're our life. You're our redemption. You're everything, Lord. Help us to give you our undivided attention, Lord. For I in Jesus Christ, my blessed Lord and Savior. Amen. Curses and allegories. Last week, Brother Wilson taught on a new gospel. And the world is full of new gospels. But there's only one true gospel. And we're going to be looking today at uh, some of the curses in the Bible. And we're going to be looking at the allegories of the Old Testament showing the plan of salvation that were hidden from Jews until Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins. The one curse that we're going to be looking at is the curse of Adam's race and the curse of changing the gospel of salvation and the curse of rejecting God's plan of salvation. In Galatians chapter 1 through 8 it says, But though we be, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which is than that which we preach unto you, let him be accursed. As we said, therefore, so I say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have received, let him be accursed. If you change the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you change any thing about it, you're bringing a curse upon yourself. And so many preachers just out of the air take some piece of uh, these new Bibles and they create, you know, a salvation by works. And they claim it's something new, but there's nothing new under the sun. The same old works gospel was preached in the Old Testament. It was preached, uh, it's, it's taught in uh, a lot of the cults. You have to do this, you have to do that. And uh, if you look at that first part of that verse, it says, or an angel from heaven. That kind of blows the Mormons right out of the water, doesn't it? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and 3, it says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through the subtlety, so your mind should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. The gospel is simple. It's easy to understand. Anyone can understand the gospel. Even a five-year-old. It's not a complicated thing, but people try to put so many things on it, they try to complicate it as much as they can. Now to the text in uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 through 31. It says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Paul's saying, 
Are you crazy? You want to be under the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he that was born free, free woman was born by promise. Amen. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, thou bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac, was are of the children a promise. But as then... He that is, was born after the flesh persecuteth him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. And we see that every day, don't we? We see the government persecuting the church and trying to uh, destroy it. We see preachers preaching false gospels, trying to destroy the church. But the Bible says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's still going to be people out there preaching the gospel as long as... We have this book, the King James 1611. Nevertheless, what saith the scriptures? Cast out the bondswoman and her son. For the son of the bondswoman shall not be heirs with the son of the free. So then, brethren, are we not children of the bondswoman? <coughs> then, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondswoman, but of the free. So there's something different about Hagar and Sarah. One was a bondswoman, one was free. One had no choice, the other had a choice. Hagar is a type of the cursed world that's in bondage. And because of that curse, whatever comes out of, of the womb is cursed. That curse started with Adam, and it's is passed down to every person on the face of the earth. Your DNA is corrupt. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Curse is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That's a pretty hard statement. If you break one little part of the law, you've broken it all. That's right. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that, the fle that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So what I'm trying to get across here, you ain't got a chance. You can't do it yourself. Amen. There's nothing about you that's redeemable. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We're all corrupt. We're all vile, repulsive when God looks upon us. There's nothing we can do about it. It's in our DNA. You can't help yourself. You can't keep the law. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, Therefore... By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The reason he gave us the law is so we will know what sin is. You know what the biggest problem of today's world is? You know what the biggest problem is? Nobody knows what sin is anymore. Amen. They don't recognize sin. Every time you look, turn around, you see somebody talking to, you know, you talk to somebody at work and you say, well, where do you go to church? And I said, well, I go down here down the street. And me and my girlfriend, and we take our little babies with us, and, and we go on to church, and we, we try to serve the Lord. I said, well, how come your preacher don't preach against living together? You're supposed to be married. Well, he never says anything about that. Well, that's why you go there. 
People don't know what sin is anymore. They don't. Just ask them. Will you do this? Well, I drink. I, I drink. I don't see nothing wrong with drinking. I go to bars and I don't see nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with drinking because the Bible says people drunk in the Bible, yeah. they drink wine. That's right. The Bible doesn't teach to drink. It t t tells you not to drink. It calls you a fool. But people don't know what... Oh, so I smoke a little marijuana. What dif difference does that make? Mm -hmm. It makes a big difference. It's sin. Yep. You're corrupting your body, the temple of God, Amen. if you're born again. In Romans chapter 7, verse 13, it says, Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin. That's what should be the prayer of every Christian in this place. They should pray, say, Lord, show me my sins. Let it be repulsive to me. Let me, be, let me abhor that sin like you would abhor it. But as Christians, we come to church and we do our little sin. We come on, we sit in our pews and we think we're, we're okay. But you need to know that if you have sin in your life, you have to recognize it and get rid of it. Look at the rest of the verse. It says, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. I want, to, I want it to be repulsive to me. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14 says, Having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart, they have exercised with covetous practice, cursed children. If you don't recognize that you're a sinner, you have a bigger problem. What's that problem? You don't know the Savior. Yeah. Do you? Romans chapter four, uh, Romans chapter eight, verse one through four, there is hope. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the laws of sin and death. That's the cure. And once you get the cure, you'll see sin in your life because God will make it so known to you that you can't, you can't hang on to it. You'll have to get rid of it. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for the sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And if you're a born-again Christian, you have two natures. You have the old nature and you have the new nature. The hardest part about being a Christian is keeping that old nature under subjection. I'm a, I'm a paid athlete. My, my company pays me to work out and stay in shape. I've got to keep my body under subjection. I've got to keep it working when it doesn't want to work. I've got to run when I don't feel like running. I got to keep it under subjection. I got to keep it. I got to keep it disciplined to a point where it it performs when I need to when I need it to perform. That's a lot of work. I'm in the gym three or four days a week, and I'm running three or four days a week. I got to work hard to keep my job. But I don't have to work hard to keep my salvation. I just have to keep work hard to keep that sin under subjection so that I can serve my Lord and be able to perform when He wants me to perform. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Praise the Lord. What Jesus Christ did for us is one day 
God says, son, I need you to go do I need you to die for the sins of these people. And the son says, yes, I'll do it. I try to write it out, and I'll get to it here in a minute. What Christ did for us. Let's see if I can find it. Because I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The only begotten Son of the living God, pure righteousness, without spot or blemish, pure holiness, and the beloved of the, of the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ took upon himself the most vile wickedness this putrefying evil world could ever imagine and, and became sin in its purest form for <coughs> undeserving mankind. The Lord Jesus Christ became what God the Father hath most hated most so much so that God the Father had to turn his back on what he loved the most. Can you imagine that? What Christ did for us. And we so flippantly take it for granted. <coughs> the Holy Spirit's witness to that guy over there. Well, uh, I'll try to get to it later. Maybe there's no later. Talk to your neighbor. Well, maybe later. Maybe there's not going to be a later. We're getting so close to the end, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And people are getting so... I mean, I talk to people at work, and they, everybody's saved. The wonderful fact that the Lord came and removed the curse of the law... And being the first to fulfill all the requirements of the law. Can you imagine that? Someone being able to do that? In Luke chapter 24, and I love this verse, 44, Jesus. <coughs> and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Everything in the Old Testament was fulfilled when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Isn't that something? I mean, isn't that something? Two births. Now we're going to get into some, to some allegories. In John chapter 3, verse 3 through 6, Jesus answered and said unto the, him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There has to be something happen. You were born once, but you've got to be born again. You've got to be born twice. Nicodemus said unto him, how can, this, can, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, the first birth, and of the Spirit, the second birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. The only remedy for your DNA that was passed down from Adam is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the first one is Cain. Cain and Abel. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 says, Not as Cain, who was of, of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Here's old Cain. He's out in the field. And he's got this, this field plowed, and it's perfectly straight and perfectly square, and all the rows are perfect. And he's made sure that everything is just lined up perfectly. And he plants those seeds and he plants the corn on this side and, you know, and puts the potatoes in and, and just has everything just beautiful, working hard by the sweat of his face, just like God said. And he's, look at this garden, it's beautiful, and he's weeded it every morning and he's just taking such good care of it. And then it comes time for sacrifice and he says, oh boy, 
I'm going to surprise God. God wants a blood sacrifice, but I'm going to give him something better. I'm going to give him the fruit of my labor. And he has all good intentions, just like a lot of us. We have good intentions. We say, well, God will be pleased with, with my works because I'm so good. Look at, look at me, God. So here's old Abel. He's a shepherd. He's out in the field. He's laying down with his head on a rock while Cain's out there plowing the field. And he's just thinking about the things of God, and he's just singing every once in a while about the praises of God. And, and then he's got a dog out there chasing the sheep around in a circle. And every once in a while he gets up and moves his sheep over to this pasture, and then he moves them over to this pasture, and he takes them down to the water and gives them something to drink. Abel's got a good life. He doesn't have to worry about lions, tigers, and bears because they ain't meat. They're not meat eaters yet. So here, here it comes for the time of harvest, and, and Cain has got this big old pile of vegetables, the most beautiful vegetables, not a wormhole in them. A bug hadn't eat on, eaten on his vegetables. They're perfect. He's got them in a big old basket. And here's old Abel. He goes out in his field and he finds the most beautiful lamb that he has without any spot or blemishes. And he picks that lamb up and he holds it in his hands and he examines the teeth and examines the eyes and examines the feet. And, and this, this lamb is perfect. Not a blemish on it. And here they, both of them come up to, to the altar and Abel's holding, or Cain is holding his big old pile of beautiful vegetables and fruits. And he said, look at here, God. Abel, on the other hand, he's on the other side of that altar and he's taking that lamb and he's holding that lamb and he's cutting the throat. Blood's going everywhere. Blood's all over Abel. Blood's all over the the throne, bloody mess. But here's old Cain. He's clean and white, and he's got that big old pile of fruit up there. Look at, look at this, God. Look what I've done for you. God says, Cain, I didn't ask for that. I asked for blood. For, what, for without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. Can't you get that through your head? And he tells old Abel, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You did good. Your sins are forgiven. Cain's enraged. I've worked so hard. I've done all this, and he should have accepted my gift. He shouldn't have been so rude to me. So he slays Abel, kills him, and God puts a curse on him. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says, but these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Are you a Cain or are you an Abel? Have you accepted the blood or are you accepted, or are you trying to get God to accept your works? The second allegory is Jacob and Esau. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, it says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. Two manners of people shall be separated from the bowels, and one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elderly shall, be, shall serve the younger. The thing about these allegories is everybody in, in this house was a Cain, or is a Cain. Everyone in this house has, part of them is a Cain. Part of them is Esau. Because that's part of the old man. That's what God's describing. He's describing the old man. The sinful part of man. Every one of us is capable of doing some terrible things. And some of us have done terrible things. But what God has shown you that you have to be born again. There has to be two births. He always uses twins in this, this allegory. Cain versus Abel. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, 
You become enabled. You become righteous. It's not your righteousness. It's his righteousness. You become just like Christ. You're justified. Esau, a type of the old man, it says, And the Lord said unto Two nations are in thy womb. Two manners of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elders shall serve the younger. In the womb, Esau and Ab or Jacob was struggling against each other. Out of the womb, they were warring against each other. That's the way man is. When you receive Christ as your personal Savior, you have two, na two nations warring against yourself all the time. And they're constantly battling to see who can win. And everybody in this house, you say, well, that's not me. I'm so good. I don't, I don't know. Hey, the older, you know, I always thought well, the older you get, the better, the easier it's going to get. It doesn't. It gets worse. It does. I mean, you could ask some of the old people. It gets worse. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 25, it says, and the first came out red all over. This is a type of sin. Esau is a type of sin. He represents the sinful nature of man, like a hairy garment, red hairy garment. When we receive Christ as our personal Savior, what kind of garment do we get? We get a white one, clean and white, no blemishes. But that's what Esau is. He's, he's a, type of, a type of sinful man. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, there, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin... And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. It's passed down. It's in your DNA. You can't get rid of it. You, you need some help. Only one person can help you. Amen. Only one person. God provided a way of redemption. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The only way to get that new nature, the only way, only way to get reborn again is through Jesus Christ. He's our life. He's our eternal. You know, the pastor was teaching her a while back. He says, Christ is our life. We have no life outside of him. We don't have nothing outside of him. We don't have no righteousness outside of him. We don't have nothing outside of Jesus Christ. And he's right. We don't. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. Jesus Christ has the remedy for your affliction. He's got the, the answer to the problem of your DNA. Isaiah chapter 52 says, 14 says, as many as, as were astounded at thee, his vintage was so marred more than any man. Jesus Christ took on the entire sinful nature of man, took the curse upon himself of every person in this room, every, everybody outside this building, the entire world's population took it upon himself right. and took it up on a tree and nailed it. And it cost him everything. He was marred more than any man. I've seen a lot of people marred in my life. I've seen some terrible things. I can't even talk about it. And I don't want to talk about it. But man can mar someone horribly. And what Christ did for us, we just can't, we can't comprehend it. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no remission you got to have the blood you got to have a transfusion you got to have a uh, you got to pick this old body up six feet and slide a new one underneath and get rid of that old one 
I mean, that's the only way you can do it. It's just like uh, as you get older, things don't work as well as they used to. You can see the, as you get older, you can see the how sin just kind of deteriorates everything and, and, and it just kind of slowly goes, you know, the things that you were able to do in your 20s, you can't no longer do. And you start, you're, it's, it's, sin is a terrible thing. Man was never meant to uh, just live 70, 80 years, 90 years. Right. He was meant to live forever. Yeah. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9 through 10, it says, Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were Esau's, we were Cain's. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Esau was a type of the church, or type of the old man. Jacob is a type of the church. If... Um, you go to Genesis chapter 32, verse 28, it says, And thy name shall be called no more Jacob. You know, Jacob, he started out pretty rough. I mean, he, he was a planter and stuff. But the thing that got Esau was that he sold his birthright for a pot of porridge. A lot of preachers today are selling their, their uh, congregations out for a pot of porridge. To feed their bellies, to make them to, to get glamour and, and get their congregations built up. That's all they're doing is they're a bunch of Esau's. Jacob didn't start out much better, but there was something about Jacob that he valued the birthright. And God liked that. But he's a type of the new nature. Look what it says here in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28 says, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. What does Israel mean? Did you ever look it up? It means he will rule as God. You say, well, no one's going to rule as God. Well, wait a minute. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you become co-heirs with Christ. Join heirs. You're justified just as if I've always been Jesus Christ. You become the sons of God. Amen. You're redeemed. You have a heritage. You have, a, you have an inheritance. It's all about Him. You become an, uh, a part of Him. You become, I mean, you're part of the body of Christ, aren't you? Yeah. Isn't that what it says? We have a great honor just by receiving Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we, be, we will rule as, as God, just like I, Israel. John 19, 15, it says, But they cried out, Away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The Jews are just like Esau. The Jews didn't want to give up their religion. They didn't want to give up their, their, uh, their, their money, their power. They thought by siding with Caesar that everything would be okay. A lot of Christian or a lot of people in churches today they think, well, I don't want to change anything. So I'll just, I'll just claim ignorance and I'll, I'll. Uh, won't accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I'll, I'll just stick with the world and claim ignorance. And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. A curse. That's what they brought on themselves. Matthew chapter 25, verse, or 27, verse 25, And then answered all the people and said, His blood shall be upon our children. And we see that. That's a curse. Can Jews be saved? Yes. 
can the nation of Israel be saved? Not until God shows himself the second time. But right now, a lot of Jews are saved, but the nation of Israel is lost. They're under a curse until God lifts it. And if you ever studied anything about Israel, Israel's had a rough way to go. They could have had it all if they've only received Christ as their Savior. In John chapter 6, 44, it says, No man cometh unto me except the Father hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last days. The only way we can be saved is through Jesus Christ. The only way we can be saved is through his word and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So many people turn their back on God day after day after day after day. God brings conviction, brings conviction, and they, they make excuses for their sins, and they just go on their way. One day, that conviction might stop. You can only be saved when Christ is drawing you. The Lord knew the hearts of the Jews. He knows your heart. In John chapter 12, verse 40, he says, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, and be converted. And I should heal them. He knew their hearts. Does he know yours? He knew their thoughts. Isaiah chapter 29, 10 says, For the Lord hath poured out upon them spirit of deep sleep. Is that what he's done? Has he brought deep sleep upon you because you've rejected Christ over and over and over again? I talk to people all the time, and I'm amazed at what kind of excuses they have for not receiving Christ as their Savior. The last allegory, which we're running out of time, there's two more, but we'll go with the last one. Adam. The first Adam and the second Adam. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 through 23, says, But now this Christ, risen from the dead, and became the first fruit of them that sleep. For since by man cometh death, came death, and by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, and after they that are Christ at his coming. Adam was, per, was made perfect. There was, he, was perf, he was a perfect man until he was tested. And when he was tested, he fell. And then death came upon all men after because he failed. He corrupted the DNA. He corrupted mankind. And everyone born after that needs to be redeemed. The second Adam, perfect, the only begotten Son of God, passed the test. He passed it for us. He gave himself for us, and through him, we have eternal life. Without him, you have death. There's no in-between. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Have you ever noticed that they're all one-syllable words? Very easy to understand, very hard to, to misinterpret. Jeremiah 8, 20, I always, I love this verse because it's true for a lot of people. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, but we are not saved. There's a lot of you that can read that verse and identify with it. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Let's pray. Our dearly Father, Lord, I pray 
Lord, I know I'm a filed creature, Lord. I'm, I'm nothing but ashes, and I'm, I don't have the greatest mind in the world, Lord, but I have a heart for you, Lord. I have a heart for your word. I pray, Lord, that you'll take this message and, Lord, stir someone's heart, Lord, that, that hasn't come to know you as their Savior. Lord, time's running out. The summer is almost ended. The harvest is about to take place. Lord, I pray that you'll save someone today, Lord. I pray that you'll bless the speaker that's coming, Lord. I pray that he'll stir that heart and that the Holy Spirit will bring, bring repentance, Lord. For I ask the name of Jesus Christ, my blessed Lord and Savior. Amen.